Please welcome Roberta Grimes, everybody. I probably should use one. I could show, but I'll Roberta Grimes spoke to South Bay Ions recently. She is a business attorney, a wife of 42 years, a mother of three, and a grandmother of five. She had an experience of light when she was eight years old. It changed her life. She wanted to understand what it was and what death is. After decades of research, she has written two books, The Fun of Dying and The Fun of Staying in Touch. In this interview, she talks about her findings. Roberta, you had an experience of light when you were eight years old. Could you talk to us about this? I was a good Christian child for the whole first part of my life. I went to Sunday school, everything was cool between me and God. And then one day in April of 1955, I was eight years old. Someone asked me the other day what day it was and came to me it was the ninth. I had no idea what day it was. But I woke up in the middle of the night and I knew there was no God. And I was terrified. And in the midst of my terror, there was this brilliant flash of light in the room. It was like burning magnesium, just a flash and it faded. But I remember my eight-year-old bedroom in the toys and awful wallpaper because of that flash of light. And as it was fading, a young male voice said, you wouldn't know what it is to have me if you didn't know what it is to be without me. I will never leave you again. Oh, I thought at eight, because everything is amazing when you're eight, so nothing is, I thought, okay, that's handy. If you forget there's a God, they remind you. And I went back to sleep. But these experiences are extraordinary. They stay in your mind. I remember 60 years later, I still remember every detail of that experience. And actually it happened a second time when I was 20, when I was in, in distress. Again, the light, this time the same voice said, just I will never leave you. And it shaped my life because I had to know what that was. I always knew there was a God, especially after the second experience. I always knew I was never alone. And I wanted to know what had happened to me. Now I've since come to understand it's the same experience that Moses had with this burning bush that was not consumed. It's the same experience that Saul had on the road and Jesus, brilliant flash of light, Jesus says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And, and turned the great apostle uh, into the great apostle he became. But it's an experience that transforms your life because it A, makes, your, makes you certain there's more that's going on, and B, makes you really want to know what it was. So as soon as I could, when I was in my early 20s, I tried, started trying to understand death. I figured that must have come from where the dead are. I don't know why I thought that, but I did. And actually, I was right. It did come from where the dead are. It took me decades to put it together. But that's what, it transformed my life because it made the most compelling, interesting possible hobby the core of what I did. I'm a wife of 42 years, a mother of three, a grandmother of five, very happy in my practice of business law. But um, by night, I turned into super researcher. And that's what it did for me. Right. How did you pursue this, uh, this uh, insight in, into light? What sources did you uh, tap into that would inform you about what it could have been? Well, I, just, you know, I saw the light as evidence of something bigger. There is more than I can see. So that came from somewhere. I wanted to know about the place it came from. I wanted to understand how reality was structured, because clearly science doesn't know. It only looks at what's material. So there wasn't much you could do in the, until about mid-70s. Fortunately, the, the glorious um, Raymond Moody came out with a life um, life after life, and he um, he transformed everything. Suddenly everybody was interested in death, and we started to get wonderful books, and the books had appendices and bibliographies and more information, and I would follow those trails. And I came upon the fact that in the early part of the 20th century, till about the 40s, we had a, a, just a treasure trove of wonderful detailed communications from the dead produced. Most of it came through deep trance mediums, which is a much more effective way of communication than psychic mediums are. Detailed, chatty, people asked questions, I got detailed answers from dead people about what was going on. So I read them, I devoured hundreds of these, these accounts of these communications which were documented by researchers. It's all very, very scientific. And what I found was they were all talking about the same place. It had the same physics, the same pe way people dressed, the same things people did, the same process, the same description of the geography of it. It was the same place. I never found an outlier. So when you put together hundreds of communications from people who all claim to be somewhere, and they're giving you what it's like, and it's all the same, you start to say, you know, there's probably something to this. And that's where, that's where I began to put together what the truth is. And you found correspondences between what Jesus said and, and what your research showed you? 
I was a very devout Christian, as you can imagine, having had those experiences. Um, I was a, at first a Protestant, when I married a Catholic, became a zealous Catholic. Lector, Sunday school teacher, very into it. But as the more I put it together, the more troubled I became. I mean, I had been reading the Bible for my whole life. I've read it through at least a dozen times, and I've read the New Testament twice as often, because I would read that, read the whole thing, New Testament, whole thing. And I did this for years, when I, in my early 50s, when I finally figured out that I really, uh, there was no, no evidence in almost 200 years, there's no evidence whatsoever that God has ever judged anybody. Of any, and there's no evidence only Christians get to heaven, and there's no evidence Jesus died for anybody's sins or needed to. I was very troubled by that. I stopped reading the Bible in my early 50s. I didn't want Jesus to be wrong. I was, he was my best friend. I didn't want him to be wrong. It was only later, as I got more and more evidence that what the dead are telling us is right, that I stopped and said, you know, I think he said a lot of this stuff. Let me just go check. I didn't want to test the Lord. I, I was still going to church with my husband. I was trying to kind of walk the walk. But I got brave one day, and I read the Gospels cover to cover. It's just four little books in the Bible. You can read them in a sitting. And it was the greatest day of my life because I discovered that Jesus told us things about God, reality, death, and the afterlife that we could not have confirmed by any means until at least the early 20th century. Little things, big things. 95% of what Jesus says in the Gospels, I can show you in the afterlife evidence. He knew exactly what he was talking about. In your book, The Fun of Dying, uh, find out what really happens next. In Appendix 2, you, it's titled Listening to Yeshua. And you begin this chapter by saying, Yeshua's words are amazingly consistent with afterlife-related evidence. But a lot of what mainstream Christianity teaches is not. You want to comment on that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> in my first, in, in 2010, when we put out The Fun of Dying, I was so afraid of Christians and their wrath, because their beliefs are so precious to them, and more important, in fact, than what Jesus says. I was, I called him Yeshua. I'm going to have my own separate Jesus. We've just put out a new edition of The Fun of Dying. We call him Jesus um, because, in fact, that's who he is. And what Jesus says is true. Jesus says we've got to love, we've got to forgive. There's no shortcuts. Many Christians believe you get a get out of hell free card once you accept him as your savior. Jesus never says it. There's no evidence that's true. There's no evidence God is judgmental or angry or has a beard or sits on a throne. We know what God is now. God is far greater than what the Christians believe. And then the minute this all came to me, I said, how could I ever believe that other stuff? It's insulting to God to say that God loves us, loves us with reservations, and only if we gets to enjoy watching Jesus horribly murdered will he forgive us. That's crazy. It's crazy. We know where it came from. Paul, bless his heart, he had a horrible event happen. They all believed that Jesus was the Messiah, the Savior, and then he was murdered. How could they make lemonade out of that horrendous lemon? So they packaged those teachings, those precious teachings, in ancient Hebrew prophecy, and they packaged them in early, you know, first century Judaism, where they were still sacrificing animals in the temple. Aha, that must have been the ultimate sacrifice. It made sense back then. Why does it make sense to a single human being now? When some Christians hear about the near-death experience, especially experiences that don't mention Jesus, they discount the near-death experience testimony of that person. Comments? Well, I, I think this is one of the sure proofs that Christianity is totally off the rails. It's not following Jesus at all. Because it, the people who, and I've met them, I've met a few of these people, people who believe that they're Christians, believe they have a get out of hell free card, don't want to hear it's hard. They want to they know it's easy. And if indeed people are having relationships that are not sort of within their church purview, suddenly it's more complicated. Understand how important that get out of hell free card is. If I accept Jesus as my personal savior, I don't have to learn to love, I don't have to learn to forgive, I don't have to do anything that Jesus says. I got a get out of hell free card. Nobody wants to hear it's going to be hard. Jesus says it's hard. Learn to love the God, Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Learn to love your neighbor as yourself. And that consists of all the Law and the Prophets. The Law and the Prophets is how they talked about the Old Testament back then. He said he just replaced the whole of the Old Testament, where, where a lot of the judgmental nastiness in Christianity, and there's a lot of it, comes from, is the Old Testament. 
He says, no, just love. That's all. Love and forgive. So, so how does this, in your, to, to go on with your question, how does this relate to near-death experiences? Near-death experiences are real experiences that happen outside of this reality. They happen at the same levels where the afterlife reality is, although they don't happen in the afterlife. And they're real. But the problem is that since Christianity is not the whole game, they have, people have experiences peculiar to themselves. Some of them, if that's what they want or need, will see Jesus, or they'll see an entity representing himself as Jesus, which apparently is what often happens. If they're Buddhist, they'll see the Buddha. They'll see whoever is going to be important to them spiritually, because in reality, it doesn't matter whether you're a Christian or not. Everybody, everybody gets to the same place. From what I've experienced, uh, a person's culture d determines how they identify the beings they meet on the other side. And yet it also seems to me that a spiritual dimension would not be dependent on cultural conditioning. So if uh, a person having a near-death experience um, uh, experiences a being from his culture, what does that say about the spiritual state? Well, I'll tell you what's true of the spiritual state. The lowest levels of the afterlife are very culturally related. Anecdotally, if you go to China and you die there, Accidental deaths almost never happen, but there are, they, they're possible. You have an accidental death in China, you will end up in the Chinese summerland levels. It will look Chinese to you. You'll go, wow, it happened! And immediately your loved ones will come and get you and take you to the North American summerland. But the summerlands are very culturally dependent at their lowest levels. And so naturally if you have a near-death experience in China, the same thing will happen. Whatever you would expect as a person of that culture, it will be around you to comfort you. Yeah. How do you understand Jesus' message now? Why did he teach? Well, I just think you should read the Gospels. I would urge anybody who says this woman is off the wall, read the red letters in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and try to put aside your cultural prejudices and your, your superstitions, which is what Christianity has devolved into. Mm -hmm. And I'm speaking as someone who has been a zealous Christian. I majored it in, co in it in college. I was a Christian until Jesus said to me, you've got to tell my truth. And I'm... I'm sorry, I have to tell the truth now. He's my boss. How do you think Jesus' message became distorted over the centuries? Well, let me first answer what his message okay. was. Right. Jesus came to teach. He says that repeatedly. I'm your teacher. Learn to love. Learn to forgive. Be perfect, therefore, as your Heavenly Father is perfect. He tried to teach people in as many ways as he possibly could to be spiritually perfect, which is exactly the reason we're here on earth. That's what the dead tell us, too. We're here to learn to love and to forgive, and all the bad things that we think are bad happening to us are like those, those machines in the gym. We're strengthening our for love and forgiveness muscles. We're learning to do it better. That's what Jesus taught. That's why he came. That was it. That was it. That was the reason. The other reason I think he came was to teach us there's no death. This is what this is what's true. He taught, taught us what God what God is, why we're here, and the fact that there is no death. And he did it beautifully. And frankly, most of what he taught has been ignored. Mm -hmm. How does that tie in with present day understanding of let's say quantum physics? Um, actually, beautifully. Um, I didn't understand a lot of what the dead were telling us until the early part of the 21st century when we began to get good quantum physics for dummies books. Quantum physics is a sort of a variant between the physics of this reality and the physics that exists in the greater reality. In the greater reality that we enter at death, which is most of reality, each of the six levels below the source, between this this being the seventh lowest level, each of those levels is, seems to be about the size of the whole universe. So we're talking it's much bigger than here. There, the physics is very different. It's all consciousness-based. We travel by mind and instantly. We communicate by mind and we can talk to anybody with, who spoke any language on earth because we're speaking by thought. Um, we create by mind. You want to build a house, you don't get a hammer and nails. You design the house, you call in more advanced beings whose minds are stronger than yours, and they think it into existence and it's permanent. It's a solid, permanent house. You, um, you learn in the more advanced levels how to make flowers that are living flowers that are there forever, real flowers. It's, it's very consciousness based and when we look at quantum physics in the very simplest way what it tells us is that people people's minds can affect matter what my hero Max Planck got the Nobel Prize in 1918 for quantum physics 
but he had he made a much bigger discovery. He wasn't the first one to discover it, but he he certainly articulated it. Human consciousness, your mind, is primary and pre-existing. It pre-exists the universe. It's eternal. It never will end. It is part of the source that brings forth the universe. Every human mind is that. He made that discovery, and he was ignored. Nobody would listen to him. They thought, I think they thought he'd gone off the deep end, but he was right. When people have a near-death experience, they immediately become aware that they are now home, and that this is the place that they came from. Does this suggest reincarnation to you? Well, no, it just suggests, I mean, we could have one lifetime here and still have, have that be our home. But your mind is eternal. It's been somewhere before it got here, and it will be somewhere in the future. So that is home. That's where we spend 99.9999% of eternity is there, not here. Mm -hmm. But there, in fact, there is reincarnation. It's not like what we think, though, because outside this material level of reality, there's no time. Time is subjective there. We can choose to experience a kind of time, or we can ignore time and have no time. And in some way, I cannot make my, my mind comprehend. All our lives are happening at once, just as all of history is happening at once. We, we, one of the, the channeled beings that I read once, I thought it made sense, said, think of reincarnation as a bucket out of which each lifetime is dipped and after, into which each lifetime is poured. So we continue to have these experiences, but they're simultaneous. And each life is affecting each other life. Um, Brian Weiss, the great um, doctor who basically invented, although I think others had also discovered it, but he espoused and, and used very successfully past life um, experiences to cure present life problems. And that works. I know it because I've done it myself with a problem I had with a fear of heights. But he found he couldn't sometimes find the cause of some terrible problem, whether it was health or, or a phobia, in, this, in, in a past lifetime. So what he did was progress people to a future lifetime. And he often started to find, I think that it's Same Soul, Many Bodies, I think is the book. He found future causes of present problems, which to me is another validation of what the dead tell us, which is that our, all our lives are happening at once. Mm -hmm. How do we communicate with the dead, or how do the dead communicate with us? Well, the, my second book uh, on this topic, which is The Fun of Staying in Touch, talks about the two sort of basic areas in this field. And I'm surprised so few people know about this. For thousands of years, the dead have been giving us signs that they're fine. In fact, they've come up with a sort of shorthand way of showing us they're okay. And uh, these signs from the dead are mind created. One of the first things we learn as we look at what they do is their minds are much stronger than ours. You have a powerful eternal mind. Your mind is part of what you would think of as God. But while you're here, it's limited by your physical body. So you can't move matter. They can move matter. They can make things disappear, reappear, go somewhere else fly off the wall while you're watching. They can make things happen um, with their minds, which we cannot do. Uh, that's one of the things they do. They leave things for us. They, they give us insect signs. They give us animal signs by affecting, they herd the insects. And I've had spectacular ones. I talk about a lot of these in the fun of staying in touch. They give, they herd insects with their minds. They can impose their will upon the minds, not just of animals and make them come up to us unafraid, for example, if they're a squirrel or a bird, but they also can impose them upon people. They can impress people to say and do things to us, and the people, I, I don't know why I said or did that. It was the your loved one who, who did that. Um, they can do quite a lot with their minds. We're learning more and more to communicate with them. I mean, we've always had mediums, and we've had, frankly, better mediums than before, We've had than, than we have now. We've had scrying, and which worked for thousands of years, and people are still doing that. It's a way of using a, a dark uh, surface with a slant front, a shiny, a dark below, a shiny top to make images appear. And that can be done very successfully by people who know how to do it. Um, we've got, um, more recently, we've got things like co induced communications. Since we are all part of one mind, it's possible when you are able to do it to meet with your loved ones in a solid place constructed by your mind and that loved one and have wonderful experiences including real hugs and conversations and chats. Uh, people who have got, had this done, I've talked to them, they've said their grief was off the charts. They had one series of sessions of induced communications and their grief was almost gone. 
This kind of thing to me is just life transforming. I'm thrilled that they're doing it. More and more we're getting electronic communications from the dead. People are, they're, they're all, these are always instituted by people who are on the other side, as we say. Um, there, there are groups of researchers who are trying to get their message to us, that they, so they live, they're fine. They should have, this should have happened 100 years ago. It's what they were trying to do in the early part of the 20th century with all those communications I was reading. But of course, scientists have stonewalled it because they consider atheism to be a, fun, to be a fundamental dogma of science. How they can have a dogma and still not be a belief system, I don't know, but that's what they say. So these teams have not given up. They're, they've been working since the 80s with people who are using electronic means to establish communication. And they've gone much farther than, than most people realize. Since the 80s, we've had telephone communications with dead people. We've had communications using computers and using other kinds of sort of black box uh, things. And there is a new sort of um, push being on the part of the dead to find the right people and get the right work done. Frankly, if there were enough money put into this, within a few years we would have these communications. It'll take longer because some of what the dead want us to do, nobody can afford to put together. But if we did, we would have uh, a phone between the now here and the afterlife. It, would, it doesn't seem to be hard, it's just expensive to get there. Mm -hmm. I think In your book, I think you said that uh, coincidence is another way by which the dead can communicate with us. It seems to me that you know, if someone is in grief after the loss of a, a loved one, they would be maybe looking for coincidences as evidence, and when they happen, I imagine a skeptic would therefore um, have evidence for discounting it, since the uh, person grieving would be looking for a coincidence. Could you, but can you talk to us about coincidence and its relationship to how the dead might communicate with us? Many of the signs the dead give are subtle. For example, one of the most common signs is pennies. Often the pennies have a date of a birth, a death, or a wedding, but pennies. You find pennies on the ground, you think nothing of it. Go, you go through a week, you might find three. If suddenly you're finding 50 pennies in a day, and then you don't find any later, the odds against chance for that are just almost incalculable. That's a coincidence, but you know, you really got to say there's something going on there. Feathers are the same way. You might not randomly find a feather. One woman told me she found 54 feathers randomly around her pool one day. Nothing before, nothing after. That's not a coincidence either. Mm -hmm. So, we, we, we have, yes, we should always be skeptical about something, but if it's extreme, you get to the point where you say that's not a coincidence anymore. Roberta, how do you see that the world could change if it became a widespread uh, perception of fact that the mind is eternal? I think everything would change. I mean, it's, do we have another hour? Uh, the, the thing is, the reason the world is the way it is now is that people think they have this little, little moment for, for joy and for pleasure, and then their minds blick out. The opposite is true. This is the hard stuff. As people begin to see that, they'll take their lessons more seriously. They'll, we will be loving and forgiving as if our life depends on it, which it does. I think people will stop thinking war is a good idea. If you want to end war, help people understand their minds are eternal. Um, it, we'll, we'll stop thinking, when we know the truth, we'll stop thinking sus superstitiously uh, we'll stop being adversarial over things like religion. I mean, the, I think one of the biggest sins of all time is that there are like 10,000 different religious, different Christian denominations. And to, that by itself tells you that that's all on the wrong track. I mean, Jesus would never have wanted that. We will, I think, begin to protect our minds from negativity. I mean, some of the entertainments are horrendous. When I first came to understand what was going on, I stopped watching television entirely, haven't missed it, stopped, watch, stopped going to the movies almost altogether. If it's not PG, I won't go. And not for the sex, because it turns out it doesn't matter. Sexual morality doesn't matter at all to God. But what matters is anger against one another, these nasty things people do to one another. I won't allow that in my mind now. You can't hate. You can't have gr a grudge against any human being and have that not affect your permanent mind. When you think of your mind as where you live forever, it's the only thing that you get to live forever in, you stop being willing to trash it. And I think that by itself is going to make a huge difference. When we're protecting our minds from negative influences, that will make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. It'll change everything. Yeah. Everything. 
If people come to this lifetime from a place of oneness, how can they look forward to growth in a world that is denser than the one that they came from? What is the advantage of coming to a world that is dense after having been in a world of light? We are told that in the afterlife levels, which is where, which really are the, the life levels, that's where we live most of our eternity, we're told there it's much harder to make spiritual progress. In the same way that it's very hard here to make physical progress unless you go to the gym. There's nothing to push against there. You can't strengthen your forgiveness muscle when everybody's forgiving everyone. You can't strengthen your love muscle when you, you just love everyone. Everything is happy, light, and love. So we come here to have negative experiences so we can strengthen our, our, strengthen our love muscle, strengthen our forgiveness muscle. It's like going to the gym. Think of this as a really tough afternoon in the gym. Your mother-in-law is a machine, your nasty boss, your, you know, whoever it is who is a real thorn in your side, those are just machines that you are using to strengthen your ability to love and forgive. And when you think of it that way, then you see it all as a good thing. And yes, you can. You can follow. If you read the Gospels, you can do what Jesus says, which is love and forgive everyone. And forgive not because or conditionally, but as if whatever they did didn't happen at all. But if people are living in this school where uh, the point is to strengthen our, our love muscles, what, what could awaken them to this fact? Read the Gospels. Read the Gospels and read the afterlife evidence. I mean, to me, now that I see it, I think it's kind of common sense, really. But we have had wise teachers come to us and we've had wise messages come to us from a lot of religions over thousands of years. When people come, when I talk about these matters, they'll say, well, you know, Krishna said that, or Buddha said that, yeah. These were all great masters who came to people and said, look, let me tell you what's going on. Let me help you grow spiritually. That's all this is about, is growing spiritually. And that's what they're all trying to teach us. Mm -hmm. So I would, frankly, I tell people the Gospels are the greatest handbook for how to live your life that's ever been written. And Christians, above all, should read and memorize the words of Jesus in the Gospels. Mm -hmm. Roberta, we're about to finish this segment of the program. I'd like to go on with an interview with you a little bit later on, but do you have any closing words about what we've talked about so far? I'm just grateful. If anyone's listened through to the end of this, I'm grateful that you have. I urge you to find these truths for yourself. I don't think you should take my word or anyone else's for it. In the back of The Fun of Dying and in The Fun of Staying in Touch, there are four books in each which will help you short course get to where I am now. If you uh, want to know more, there's another 70 books listed there in an annotated bibliography. You can you can find this all about, out about for yourself. You can. It might take you a year if you, if you read all the books, and then you'll be exactly where a lot of other people are now, and their lives are transformed, and they're living happily, and they're living eternally, and that's what I hope for for you. Okay. Roberta, thank you so much.